Welcome to the session. Um, nice to see that people go to sessions that are actually important, like stuff like JDBC, and not that just the stuff that is fun and new and uh, hip. Because um, I think like somewhere in the last days, I heard a statistics like that 80% of the downloads at start.spring.io actually contain a JDBC driver. So pretty much everybody still uses this stuff. Anyway, before getting into to the meat of the talk, I'd like to tell you a little story. Um, it's quite some time ago, about 30 years. Damn, that's, that's scary. I was still going to school. In America, it probably would have been high school. And a friend of mine approached me at school and asked me if I could help him because after school he planned to pick up a sofa. And I thought, well, yeah, sure, why not? Drive to the shop, get that sofa, get it to his place, then go back to my place. It takes maybe one or two hours extra. Shouldn't be a problem, right? Well, we get in his car, we start driving, 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 and after like two hours, I start wondering like, where the heck is this shop where you want to get that sofa? It turns out it wasn't that far anymore. It was like another half hour, um, pick up the sofa, pay for it, get it into the car. It took maybe another hour, um, get it to his place, another two and a half hours, um, and then get finally to my place back home. It was like, I don't know, the total of six or seven hours. It was really late when I arrived at home. Interestingly, I can't remember that my parents reacted to that in any way at all. Um, seemed pretty normal to them, I think. I don't know what to make out of that. Well, the whole thing is kind of a fun story. Eh? We like to remember it. Um, we talk about it if we meet again. And I guess it actually strengthened our friendship, like having experiences together, right? Of course, that would have changed if a thing like that would happen like every other day. It would probably have pretty much destroyed the friendship really, really fast. What does that have to do with my talk? You'll see. Let's first talk about relational databases. Relational databases are awesome. The first one popped up in the 70s, so they're like, what? 40 years old, over 40 years old, almost as old as I am. And as just mentioned, they are still used by many, many people, which makes you wonder why. I mean, this whole NoSQL stuff got lots of attention, and of course, it, they get used as well, but compared to relational databases, they are still niche. Why are relational databases so prominent in our industry? I think there are multiple reasons. One is they are like the dry principle built into code. Every piece of information by design has a single place to be in a relational database. Relational databases have strong consistency guarantees. You can put constraints on your columns that make sure that certain values will never ever be null, or check constraints that they adhere to a certain, a certain regular expression, and probably most powerful foreign keys that guarantee that if you reference a row in another table, that row will actually exist and can't go away. If anybody of you ever tried to build that manually without a relational database, like into an application, he probably created lots of bugs or used a lot of brain power to get that right. So it's really nice to have that built into the database, right? And the reason why this works so well, at least in my opinion, is that relational databases have a solid foundation in mathematics. There are actually things that are proven about these things. And don't get me wrong, 
I like mathematics. I actually studied physics, which is basically mathematics with add-ons. But I still don't want to deal with mathematics every, every day at work when I'm coding. And you don't have to. But the fact that these things are proven and based in mathematics, this leads to really solid abstractions that don't only work most of the time, but that actually work all of the time. And I think we know a lot of applications, a lot of libraries that present us with some kind of abstractions that aren't founded in mathematics at all. And they typically are very, very leaky abstractions. Where you start out and use it and everything is nice and then suddenly you see corner cases where stuff behaves just weird. You hardly see that with databases. And then we have SQL. Again, SQL, a child of the 70s, kind of ugly, coming from a time where people thought that programming languages should be readable just like English, but at the same time obviously weren't totally not cap capable of creating such a language. So they created stuff like SQL, which contains a lot of English words, but doesn't read at all as, like English. But SQL is immensely powerful. I don't know, many people probably just use, if at all, insert, update, delete, and uh, select statements with a where clause, maybe with a group by. But if you get into the details of SQL, starting with having, with anal analytic functions, you'll soon realize that SQL is immensely powerful. Actually, current SQL dialects are Turing complete. You can do literally everything with SQL. Don't really do that. I mean, you probably could write your next web application completely in SQL alone, but that probably still isn't a good idea. But you have this power, and actually it's fairly often not used at all. And with all these things, we build stuff like this. Schemas. Most of the time, probably more than six tables. Maybe 60. Maybe 600. Or maybe even 6,000. And they work, kind of. Actually, they work perfectly, but they still have problems. Despite all these great features of relational databases, there are problems with those. And many of those go down to scalability. Are there any database administrators in the audience? Oh, in the first row. That's <laughs> going to be dangerous. <laughs> they don't like to be told that they are kids, their databases actually aren't that scalable, aren't that fast all the time. It already starts with like, I had a big discussion a long time ago with the DBA of my project about the performance of the database. And he was like, you can't get faster than a relational database. And that, if you think about it, that's obviously stupid. If you just need data and you have that data in a flat file in exactly the format you need, nothing is going to be faster than just reading in this flat file. If you have any additional structure in there, it will cost you performance. But of course, you do get a lot of stuff for that, like all the flexibility to sort it uh, whatever way you want, um, to have all these different queries. If you want to build that based on a flat file, then you are for certain uh, better off with a database, a re relational one. One thing that limits scalability are locks, especially in uh, the relation with uh, the constraints I mentioned before. If you have a foreign key constraint between two tables and you want to insert a row in the first table which references a row in the second table, you need a lock on that reference row on the second table because otherwise the database would check that the row is there, insert the new row, 
and somebody else in the meantime deletes the other row that you just checked is there. You don't want that to happen, so you need some kind of locks there. And locks always limit scalability. But even if locks don't create a problem for you, the sheer resource use of check-in foreign constraints might. The foreign constraint, if you like do normal basic CRUD stuff, you hardly think about putting a foreign constraint in or not. If you need it from a domain uh, perspective, you probably do. But they don't come for free. Again, if you want to insert a row that reference another row, the database first has to find this other row. It basically has to perform a SQL statement. Most of the time, that will be just an access by index, so it will be really, really fast. But if you do millions or even billions of inserts, this gonna be, uh, is going to add up. And in many batch process, you end up with disabling foreign keys. And then maybe, at least for me, most important, what is if you want to scale above a single server? If your single server doesn't fit your needs anymore for one reason or another. Many databases have features that you can access tables in a different database just the way you can access tables in your own database. They look completely the same, which is nice exactly in the same sense as it was nice when my friend asked me to pick up that sofa. Because now you have a table in the, your schema that you might want to join with, but suddenly this join will take orders of magnitudes more time and resources where, as if the table is actually in your database. And you don't see the difference. I'm not complaining about that accessing a different database is slow. It is bound to be slow. It goes across the network. The problem is when you don't see this stuff anymore. This trips you up as a developer and causes performance problems or even bugs. So these are kind of problems inside the database, but it gets even worse once you try to get data into your actually ap application assuming that you don't write the application in, the, in a Turing-complete SQL dialect. You probably want your data from the database into a Java or Kotlin or whatever application. And then it's going to get funny. Ted Neuert um, coined the phrase that object relational mapping is basically the Vietnam of computer science. And we're going to see why this is the case. Who here has tried to write his or her own object relational mapper? There's still a few hands. A pretty young audience, I guess. Um, back in the time before we had Hibernate, we had many object relational mappers, all differently. And they basically all had only one thing in common. They sucked. <laughs> this led many teams and many single developers to think, well, it can't be that hard. I create my own object relational mapper, uh, which obviously resulted in even worse implementations of that pattern. So what is the problem? Why is this so hard? You start easy. You think, well, I have entities in my domain and these obviously map to tables, right? That's straightforward. And then I have properties in my classes and these map to columns. This is simple, right? We are almost done. All we now have to do is map references. References are obviously foreign keys, but if you look at a real schema, like not a tiny one like the one I just showed you a couple of slides ago, but a real one with 60 or 600 tables, chances are they are all connected. And if you want to load a customer which has orders, you very often probably don't need the orders. So you come up 
with something like lazy loading. You load the customer, and the customer has some kind of proxy, whatever, that basically looks like it's going to contain the orders, but it actually doesn't. And it will fetch it for you once you access it. Which creates two problems. One is a minor one and might actually be um, removed if you choose a different way to implement your object relational mapper than Hibernate and JPA does, which are lazy loading exceptions. The context where you loaded your original object is just gone, and if you now try to load the rest of your object, you get an exception. That's kind of okay because it's hard to miss an, ex an exception. I mean, I've seen application with catch runtime exception and then empty curly braces, but we don't do that, right? So we will notice the exception, we can fix the problem. But there's another kind of problem, which is, again, the SOFA problem. We access the collection of orders, which looks like a tiny dereferencing in the JVM, which should be done in a couple of nanoseconds. But what really is happening is our object relational mapper is creating a SQL statement, sending that SQL statement over the uh, wire to a database. The database is processing that SQL statement, coming up with a result, sending it back, and this might take, what, a millisecond, 10 milliseconds? Again, a millisecond doesn't sound that bad, right? But it's a thousand times slower than accessing something in local memory. And I've seen people bitten by that over and over again in projects, where stuff was just fine in the test environment and then suddenly got horribly, horribly slow in production where the uh, number of rows was just way bigger than everything they had in test. So we do eager loading, right? Lazy loading is kind of stupid, we learned. We do eager loading. And that is actually great. You get your first object from the database, then you wait like five to 10 minutes, and then you have your complete database in main memory. <laughs> You're laughing, that's actually a great state to be in. Because now everything is going to be really, really fast because you're only accessing stuff in your local memory. You probably should make sure that from time to time you actually write your changes to the database because otherwise somebody is getting really, really angry with you once the power goes down or something. But it's a great state to be in. <coughs> Sorry. Unfortunately, some people have so much data that it just doesn't fit into main memory. So what are they supposed to do? Well, nowadays, if you do Java, you probably just use JPA, which is great because you have the option to either use lazy loading or you use eager loading, which means you can have lazy loading exceptions, you can have the sofa problem, and you can have your main mem memory filled up with stuff that you don't need all at the same time. <laughs> That's great, right? Well, no, it isn't. And at that point, we are just talking about reading stuff, right? What is if we want to persist stuff or delete stuff? Maybe as an example, take deleting. If I delete an order, I probably want to delete the order items, right? Order items without an order probably doesn't make sense. I probably don't want to delete the product the order was referencing to because my, somebody else might still want to buy that just because I don't want to buy it doesn't mean you want to buy it. So this led in, in JPA Hibernate to all these cascade stuff where you can actually have different uh, cascading behavior for persisting stuff and deleting stuff and loading stuff, which is uh, a really fun way to make really complex problems with really weird behavior, like something works and something that looks like almost exactly the same doesn't work at all, and throws exceptions that give you, if you're at least not very experienced, 
no hint at all what is going on and what is not working. So this doesn't feel really good. Another example, which is basically the same problem, is that of optimistic locking. Many, many people use optimistic locking, right? You have uh, an additional column um, in your database, uh, typically called version. And whenever you read it, you read that version with uh, everything else. And if you write to the database, you do two things. You increment that version, basically as a marker. OK, I changed this data. And also, in the update, you compare the version that you have in main memory to the version that is right now in the database. And if that doesn't fit, it means somebody else accessed that row and changed that row in the meantime. And in order to be sure that all your business decisions that you made in the meantime time make sense, you better start over. And to help you with that, you get an optimistic locking exception, which is great. That's the way it's supposed to be. But now look at an order again. Let's assume I have a process that processes the payment I received to orders and checks like, OK, I received this payment from this customer. And I have this open order um, by the same person. And I check the value of the order against the value of the payment. And if they match up, I mark the order as paid. And I update the database. In the meantime, another process, maybe the customer itself, goes in and adds 25 line items to the order. 25 MacBook Pro fully loaded. And I just marked that order as fully paid. Because when he adds a row to the order item table, does the version in the order get updated? Does it in Hibernate? OK, nobody seems to know. So you don't use Hibernate, right? Who's using Hibernate? OK, and you don't know that stuff. That's kind of scary, isn't it? <laughs> Actually, I don't know either. I'm pretty sure there's a way to configure that. But, uh, and I think the default is, no, the version doesn't get updated in the order. Um, but again, there's something that can really easily go really badly wrong. And a room full of Hibernate developers don't know how it behaves. That is kind of scary. Let's get away from the scary stuff, let's go back to fun stuff. Whoever wrote integration tests with databases? OK, that's not everybody, but plenty. Who enjoyed that? I know that's the pervert. I'm allowed to say that he's basically my team lead, so that's OK. Well, what is the problem? The problem, again, is the schema that is like connected all over the place. You want to write an integration test that does something with orders, let's say. But the orders reference products, so you need a product. And the product has a product type, so you need a product type. And a product type has a main responsible person for marketing, so you need that person. And such a person has a boss, so you need a boss person. And you end up with creating dozens of rows in your database in all different tables, although you really just want to look at the order and the order item. That really doesn't feel right, right? And actually, there's a solution. And that solution, I almost assume many people here have read about that probably about 10 years ago or something. And it's domain-driven design. In the book, Domain Driven Design by Eric Evans, do you want to take a photo of the previous slide? I can do that for you. <laughs> but now you have to tweet it, right? <laughs> OK, in this book, 
he describes the concept of an aggregate. An aggregate is a cluster of objects that belong together, that are used as a single entity, basically. Entity now in a single unit. And if, that, if we apply that concept to our little schema, it might look like this. It's perfectly fine to have aggregates that consist just of a single entity, but many will contain a few. If you have many entities in one aggregate, you are probably doing something wrong. And every aggregate has one special entity. That is the aggregate root. Marked it like this. And the aggregates that consist just of a single entity, the choice is pretty obvious. In cases where you have multiple entities, there's often, like if you think, like how would I name the aggregate? There's normally an entity in there that has exactly that name. And that normally becomes the aggregate root of that aggregate. And the purpose of the aggre aggregate root is to be a handle for that aggregate. Everything outside an aggregate can always only reference the aggregate root. Never ever anything inside. This especially means, like in the example of the Lego model, we don't hand out the list of content and hand it to something else in our application so it can add or remove stuff in there. This is not going to happen. Instead, it has to call a method on the aggregate root, and the aggregate root does all the changes it needs. It might be just adding or removing a row in that collection, but maybe it has other constraints. Maybe all the bricks that appear in the content also have to appear in some way in the manual. So the aggregate root can verify that. And then there's one more rule about aggregates. Is aggregates are always consistent. Strong transactional consistency, which means an aggregate is always in a consistent state except when I'm in the middle of a method of the aggregate root. Whenever I'm outside, the aggregate is consistent. And since it's a unit, I always handle it as a unit, I store it as a unit, I load it as a unit, it's always consistent in the database as well. <coughs> but across aggregates, I only have eventual consistency. And that's again a part where I have to, I'm a little scared of the database administrator guys, because that means we just lose all the foreign keys. Because otherwise we can't have eventual consistency, right? But bear with me. We still have a problem. How do we build eventual consistency in our Java model? How is that going to look like if I have a product that reference, or an order that reference a product? The product has to be there. I have to have the Java object, right? But hey, we are at a spring conference, so the solution is obviously annotations. Um, well, annotations are great. Probably the best addition to the Java language ever. But actually, in this case, we have a much easier, much simpler solution. And the solution is just don't use references. If you reference something in a different aggregate, which then has to be an aggregate root because we are not allowed to reference anything else, we just reference it by ID. And that's basically it. It really sounds simple, but it's an immensely great idea. All the problems, or almost all the problems, suddenly just go away. Everything just becomes a piece of cake. Loading, persisting, deleting. We just said an aggregate is one unit. We always handle it as a unit. We only it has to be always consistent. That means if I have an aggregate of an order, in order to be consistent, it has to have all the order items. That means if I load it from the database, I always load it with everything that belongs to that aggregate. 
And that's limited because it's an aggregate. It's not everything. If I delete it, I delete everything. If I delete an order, I delete all the order items, but I don't delete the customer and the product, the stuff that is outside, that is in different aggregates. Optimistic locking. Again, the unit is the aggregate represented by the aggregate root. So I have only a version attribute in the aggregate root. And when I, whenever I update an aggregate, I update that version attribute of the aggregate root. Problem solved. The scenario I just described with order and order item doesn't happen because they all go through the aggregate root. Integration tests. Well, we dropped all the foreign keys. I'm always looking at you. He's, he's still smiling, but I don't know if it's like a mean smiling. Still looks friendly. We don't have any foreign keys anymore. So if I want to write an integration test with an order and order items, I can just reference the products 47, 11, 23, and 42, and nobody cares. Because my integration test doesn't care by definition. I want to test order and order items. And um, the database doesn't care either anymore because it doesn't have any foreign keys anymore. I mean, not across aggregates. Inside aggregates, we still have foreign keys. Also, for people like me, things get easier because I now don't need to support M to one or M to N relationships, which is really, really great because these are really, really hard. Why don't I have to support those? Because those, if you think about it, are always references across aggregates. If many things reference a single one, if that is not a different aggregate, then it has to be inside one of those M things that is referencing it. But then the other things are referencing something inside a different aggregate, which can't be. So M to one and M to N relationships are always references across aggregates, and we don't have those anymore. Well, we don't have those on the Java side. On the Java side, they're just IDs. In the database, we still have these references, just as normal foreign keys. Um, the schema looks exactly the same. The only difference is that we now make a clear boundary, like what does belong to this aggregate and what does belong to, the, to a different aggregate, including in the case of M to N relationship, which I like have an M to N table, like uh, this mapping table in between, which kind of in the database uh, worldview doesn't belong to either table. In our new view of aggregates, it strictly, strictly belongs to one of the aggregates. And these choices um, have a lot of benefits. And they kind of hinge at these foreign keys in many cases. Because we have options here. We can do what I just described and just drop them which allows us to even to split aggregates or not to divide different aggregates and put them in different systems. They don't even have to be all relational. We can have the one kind of aggregate have be in a relational database and then put a different aggregate, a different kind of aggregate, maybe in a Neo4j, a graph database or a Mongo database, uh, whatever fits the kind of aggregate we're dealing with. And it doesn't make any difference on the Java side because we are just dealing with IDs in pretty much every kind of database, no matter how weird and NoSQL it is, probably can access elements, things, by ID. Otherwise, I would get really skeptical about that tool. So we can completely split stuff up.
which should, uh, should sound nice for everybody who is um, riding the microservice train, like where everything is nicely cut into uh, vertical slices. You can do that perfectly fine with that. But many people probably kind of miss the foreign keys. So we could use deferred constraints. Because actually, we, we use this eventual consistency between aggregates just as a tool to arrive at the idea, at the option to use IDs to reference different aggregates. There's really nothing in there that forces us to really make this eventual consistent. So we can play with that. And one way are deferred constraints. For those that don't know, deferred constraints behave almost exactly like normal constraints with the single exceptions that they aren't checked on every data manipulation language statement, so not after every insert or update, but only when a commit is issued, which is great for integration tests, because in integration tests, at least if you do them the typical way it is basically prescribed or recommended by the Spring framework, you actually don't do a commit at the end. You just create your data, perform your action that you want to test, assert the result, and then you make a rollback. So you have the constraints in your database, which get checked at commit time, which is important for production, but for tests, they are basically irrelevant, and you still can reference the product 47, 11, 23, and 42, no matter if it actually exists in the database or not. Or if you have a really conservative database administrator, you still can use normal constraints. Because again, there isn't real, uh, a real requirement to get away with the foreign keys. It was just an intermediate step for us to help think about the problem. And even if you have normal constraints, now your database looks as it is right now, exactly the same, without any changes. So one might wonder, what have I gained? Now I have all the IDs in my Java code, instead of easy to use references, and I need to dereference the IDs using a repository or something, which is certainly an extra step and kind of annoying. But I got a lot of flexibility. I, at any point in time, can go back to the other options I just presented and pull stuff out, put it in a different application, in a different system. Even if I don't do that, suddenly these borders between things become obvious, which is nothing else than modular blah, breaking your application in modules, which Pana's recommended to do as a good thing, again, I think in the 70s. And so far, I don't think anybody came up with a good argument against that. If you now have these aggregates, the uh, next good thing to do would be to put them in packages. Every aggregate gets its own package. And if you then apply a little rule that you don't have cyclic dependencies between packages, you get a real strong structure for your application. It will feel painful at the beginning. You can almost promise that if you never worked this way. It is kind of irritating, but it really helps because people have to think about where stuff belongs. And this alone is, I think, a great benefit. So we talked about relational database. We talked about domain-driven design. Um, I guess it's time to talk a little bit about Spring Data JDBC. What does that have to do with all this? Well, you probably guessed it. Spring Data JDBC forces you to do exactly as I just described. Spring Data JDBC, one of it key strengths, in my personal opinion, is it does not support M to 1 and M to N relationships other than using IDs. It forces you to think about your aggregates, otherwise you get, will get 
in problems really, really fast and really, really obvious. And again, I think that's a good thing. The sofa problem is so bad because you don't notice it until it causes really serious problems and you're in production with an application that doesn't perform. Um, instead, I very much prefer a library, a framework that basically smacks you on your fingers when you do something that it considers a bad idea. And this is what Spring Data JDBC does. So let's take a look how code the Spring Data JDBC actually looks like. I try to make it a habit not to do live coding in presentations because uh, I'm not Josh Long and watching me to code is actually rather painful and nobody really deserves that. So what I have here is basically um, the domain model for the the diagram that I showed multiple times during the talk. Um, one of the simple entities, the aggregates that just consist of a single entity was the brick. And the brick might look like this one. It's a simple class, simple as it can get. Um, it doesn't even have to have getters and setters. You can have them and uh, Spring Data will use them if they are there but you can use plain fields if you want. As you can see here, um, you can have non-default constructors. If you the names of the constructor map to field names, um, Spring Data will be happy to use them. You could even make this immutable and have all the fields be final. Um, in that case, you would need to provide a constructor with all the arguments, obviously, and you also would need, um, in the Java version, withers. I don't know a better name for those. Basically, setters that don't return void, but a new instance of the immutable class. Um, Spring Data JDBC can use those as well. Was there a question? Um, builders are right now not supported. Um, but what should work, uh, another thing, is um, Kotlin, Kotlin data classes. They do work as well. And really, the only thing that is hinting at this being a Spring Data JDBC entity is the ID annotation. All aggregate roots need an ID annotation because we need an ID. Um, another possibly important thing is um, if you have maybe a project where you have still have JPA in there, this obviously is the ID annotation from Spring Data. And basically, if you work with, with Spring Data JDBC and you see Java X persistence in your imports, something probably went wrong and it won't work. And that import is probably the reason. So, there's really not much uh, to talk about. Um, those of you that ever used Spring Data probably know how to create repositories simply by extending the CRUD repository. It takes two type, um, two type arguments. First, the aggregate root type, and second, the ID type of that aggregate root. And it will provide uh, various methods for you that we can actually look at. And here, for example, you get the save all method, um, also save a single entity, count all entities, uh, check if an entity exists, and of course, the deleting entities. More interesting is the Lego model. The Lego model starts out just as simple as the brick with an ID. Um, it has some more uh, um, attributes um, which are uh, supported straightforward. Slightly more interesting might be the list of manuals. It's just a list. Um, the manual 
again, is an entity, which means a simple Java class. And it doesn't even have an ID, because if the um, legal model reference the manual, that this indicates that the manual is part of the legal model aggregate. So basically, the ID of the manual becomes the ID of the Lego model it belongs to, plus the index in the list. The same applies for if you have maps in there, instead of the index of the list, you now have the key of a map. Um, it depend. So the question, sorry, the question was, uh, is this a value object? Um, that's actually a tricky question. It depends on the real exact definition that you use for value object. You actually could make it like immutable and have an equals and hash code and everything. And in that sense, it would be a value object. But it really does have an ID inside the database. It's just that this ID is no longer visible and necessary in Java. And in that sense, it's really more an entity. OK? So the really interesting stuff then happens with the content. If you remember the diagram, the content references bricks. And bricks are a different aggregate. So now we get the situation where we have to use IDs. And the way that works is we actually have an add method here to add bricks to the legal model. Um, it doesn't have to be add. Whatever you name this method, it's just a plain method. Um, Spring Data JDBC doesn't care about it at all. The point just is we take proper brick objects here but we just use them to extract the ID and create brick content item objects out of it. And these are just simple entities, just as the manual that we just saw. They have just this one kind of special brick ID attribute that uh, references a brick. And that's it. And we can use that um, again in the test. Up here, we create our bricks, we save them, and in this case, it's actually important that we save it, them before we use them in the Lego model, because the way it is set up in this case is the IDs get generated by the database. So if I uh, just create the bricks up here, they don't have IDs yet. So if I add them to a legal model and try to extract the ID, I will, get ru I will run into problems. So I have to save them. At that point, they will have IDs. I can use them in the legal model. I add them, and I save them. And all this actually does work and store data, stores data in the database. One moment. So here you have all the insert statement. It does all the inserts on the bricks, then in the Lego model, and then an insert into content, which um, should look exactly as one uh, expects. Sorry, here was a question. Yeah, um, that's pretty much uh, similar. Um, just as JPA, we have a default. Um, which maps basically attribute names to column names one to one, and camel case gets converted to snake case with like underscores. Um, there's a naming strategy to change that like all over the place, and you also have column annotations to change that in like a single for a single attribute. And there are table annotations and all kinds of stuff that I don't have time um, to talk about in detail. And that's already what I wanted to show you as far as code goes. Actually, 
So we looked at code. If you think what I told you is a good idea, no matter if you think you like Spring Data JDBC or want to use it or not, um, there are a couple of resources that I would like to recommend to you. Um, first, three articles. It's basically one article in uh, three pieces by Vaughan Venon. Uh, where it talks about how to, like, how to decide what is an aggregate and what is a separate aggregate in great detail. Um, lots of good ideas and advice in there. Um, if you actually are interested in Spring Data JDBC, you of course can always approach me. Um, but there are a couple of things you probably want to look at. Um, on the top right is the talk I gave about it last year at Spring 1, and then there are two articles basically doing a basic introduction, and of course there's reference documentation, and um, more and more Stack Overflow uh, questions. And then finally, if you still want to use JPA, or maybe still have to use JPA, there's this great article which uh, discuss again um, basically similar stuff that I just told you, but um, also describes what hoops you have to jump through in order to make it somehow work more or less in JPA. And it ends in um, recommending its own persistent uh, framework, um, which you might, want, uh, might be interested in uh, if you're using Scala. That's probably not that many people. And finally, that's me if you want to contact me um, or if you want to talk to me about stuff other than software development, um, stuff I do. I work for Pivotal as part of the Spring Data team um, and are responsible for Spring Data JDBC and Spring Data JPA, so I have to use both. And just as a reminder, think in aggregates. I think even if you don't, if you still use normal references, if you still use JPA, but get in the habit to think about where are your aggregates in your domain model. I think it will help your understanding how your application is connected and uh, if you have to do any refactoring, moving to uh, microservices or anything, need to break it up. Um, boundaries, it's probably a really bad idea to split anything like across a single aggregate. Um, you probably want to avoid that, which is hard if you don't know where your aggregates are. And with that, I'm done. Just the disclaimers, the sources for all the nice images. And that's it. <laughs> Time for questions. So there's one. Mm -hmm. So how does this work? Are you providing the order mapping behind the scenes or somewhere where we can do the abstraction of migration from one relational database to another without making... Okay. Um, that was actually more than a question. It was a statement and a question. The first statement is uh, I said that JPA is a thing of a past. Everybody used Spring Data JDBC. And the question was how about abstracting over different databases? How does Spring Data JDBC do that? First, the statement, that's not exactly what I just said. And I mean, I actually do think Spring Data JDBC is the conceptual better solution. But it also is uh, rather new and there are um, some interesting stuff that is still missing. So um, yeah, people start using it in production uh, successfully. Uh, I'm not saying you should like uh, migrate your 10 years legacy application tomorrow to Spring Data JDBC, that's probably not going to be fun. Um, for the question about abstracting over databases, well, we provide the repository and the repository, um, like the, the API is totally database independent. Um, we support uh, MySQL, Postgres, 
I think H2 is the memory. In memory data database we use, um, there's like one important thing like that you probably use, will use a lot where you have a method in your repository and annotate it with a query annotation. That is actually data specific SQL. So if you stick to a standard uh, subset of SQL, it would be database independent, but you probably will really easy end up with database specific code, which again, in my opinion, is most of the time not that much of a problem. Of course, it is a problem for people that create applications that need to be deployed by different customers that then provide their database. Um, but again, this is also uh, something that we plan to improve on so that you can store your statements externally and uh, have that database independent. But you will still have to like do the conversion. If you have like two databases that require different kind of SQL, you still have to write both uh, SQL statements. Okay? They, okay. Is so, so my question is like uh, the database might have an ID to the children. So how does Spring uh, data knows which columns are there? Um, so the question was um, the aggregate root has an ID, but all the children inside the aggregate don't have an ID. And how does the database, like if you have an ID, uh, ID column in the database, how does that fit? Um, and the answer is you can still have an ID column in the other entities. It's just basically waste. You don't need that. Um, and you have an, a primary key or you can have, if like the, the way it is basically I would recommend to do it, within an aggregate, the elements inside an aggregate have an um, either as a primary key the same value as the aggregate root in case of a one-to-one -one relationship, or they have the ID of the aggregate root plus an additional column, or if you have deeper nested elements, uh, multiple additional columns that together make up a primary key. And that is used by Spring Data JDBC. If you want to provide an uh, ID anywhere, um, that is used as well, and um, should just work. Okay? So you basically said that uh, quarantines go away, like, you know, other than within an aggregate, but, I mean, aggregates should be able to reference other aggregates through aggregate root, but you, you basically have, like, a quarantine conceptually, but it's not, like, this important. Well, um, you basically, um, you still can have a normal foreign key in the database. The key is only to like really separate the aggregates and that's why I basically introduced it over like let's throw the foreign keys away and look what happens then. Um, but you still can have the foreign keys. It's just that you might lose some of the benefits. Um, for example, integrate if you like have a full foreign keys between aggregates you still have, uh, again, your problems with the integration test, right? So that's a typical trade-off. But now you, you basically have the option and you have some, some arguments uh, for and against foreign keys that you can evaluate yourself and decide what is best for you. Exactly. There's a question. Um, does the Spring Data JDBC library support table creation as well? No. Right now, uh, you have to create your tables yourself. I did that here with uh, Schema SQL. Um, probably in production, you want to use uh, Flybase or Liquibase or something similar. Um, OK, to repeat the question, does Spring Data JDBC create tables for you? Answer, no, it doesn't. Sets for an age group, 
my question is that sometimes that reference, you need to pick that it's going to be part of one aggregate but not the other. So how do you kind of um, so the, the question is, I think basically is how about things that you would in JPA model as bidirectional relationships, right? It's uh, the way I, it is modeled right now. Um, the Lego set reference, for example, an, uh, an age group. And what is if I want to find all Lego set for a given age group, like go the other way? And the answer is simple, write a query for that. Um, just have your, your brick repository, have a method, uh, get me all Lego sets for um, a given age group, um, which should be really easy to do. It's just the only thing is you have to, to uh, create the query itself or, or yourself. Well, if you, if you look at it, at the example, or the question was, um, I stated M to 1 and M to N relationships aren't supported. Um, the answer, I showed you in the example, the, the Lego set references, or the, the content, um, references bricks. So that's basically a many to one relationship, right? Many, many Lego sets can reference the same brick. And also, um, oh, it's actually M to N. And, but I, I broke that relationship at this one point, at the reference to the brick, and basically said, I just reference the brick by ID. The important point here is that happens only on the Java side. That's a constraint on, your, um, on the way you model your domain, because basically what Spring Data JDBC does is, if you give it an aggregate route and says, persist all this, it tries to navigate the, uh, everything from the aggregate route as far as it can and considers that part of the aggregate. Um, so in the database, it looks exactly as, it, uh, as one would expect. Um, actually, can I have the screen back? If you look at the schema, um, I don't have foreign keys in here, which is basically me being lazy. So it could be full with foreign keys, wouldn't uh, change a thing. Um, you actually do have the content referencing um, a brick here via the brick ID, um, which could have a foreign key, again, uh, to the brick. So your database, your database schema doesn't change at all. It looks exactly the same as you would model it normally. On the Java side, uh, this is modeled by, on the one hand, have a set of brick content items in the Lego model, and the brick content items then have here the break ID and get mapped by uh, using the table annotation to the content table. But what's the model in which you, you pull back the hundred? Do you have to get back the hundred content items and then go individually on each of those hundred to get the individual records? Or can you do that in a, a bulk manner? Um, you can do like a find all and then provide a collection of IDs. So you could uh, query uh, like a hundred items in one go, wouldn't be a problem. <laughs> oh, actually, um, to to the question, like the question was, um, if like I have a collection of a uh, hundred content items, do I have to get the bricks one by one? The first answer is you always uh, can do a find all and then just provide a big list of IDs, so you can provide uh, load all the bricks for one Lego set in one go, or even for multiple Lego set. And even beyond that, um, this is basically, or mainly, this modeling thing about the CRUD part of your application. If you have, um, like, if you want to create a report, which goes, often goes across multiple aggregates, 
there's nothing keeping you from having one big SQL statement, uh, joining everything together that you want, and creating one big entity about, out of it, which then would, the only thing you have to be careful about is don't try to persist that entity, then funny stuff would happen. Um, but if you try to persist a row from a report that probably does strange stuff all the time everywhere. Okay? Yeah? So are you, are you saying that yes, I mean, we can still implement DDD constructs of aggregate, aggregate rules using JPA, right? I mean, is that anything you can ask? You, um, so the question is, um, uh, can we do this DDD approach with JPA? And the answer is definitely yes. Um, you can, I mean, you can do exactly the same with JPA. You can just say, I don't have reference to different aggregates. I just put IDs in there. Nothing is keeping you from doing uh, that. Um, what you also can do, which is uh, kind of a, a middle ground, is use your cascade annotations to basically think about what is an aggregate and then always only cascade from aggregate root to all the elements inside the aggregate, but not across aggregates. Um, that is kind of easier to digest to hardcore JPA developers, I guess. Um, so again, you have, you have multiple options. Okay, five more minutes. Okay, um, question was, does this support R2DBC? There's actually a separate project, Spring Data R2DBC. Um, Spring Data R2DBC and Spring Data JDBC have a common core where we try to um, reuse stuff um, that both models use. Right now, they are, they are like things R2DBC can do that uh, JDBC can't and vice versa. Um, but I guess uh, long term, they will become more and more similar so that stuff that works in one will also work in the other. Um, well, basically, yes, definitely uh, Spring uh, Spring Five. Uh, like the last, the first version, the first GA version came out last year, which uh, always also saw um, uh, the five. Was it five point one? Anyway, definitely beyond five. And w well, yes, we depend in in any case on the Spring framework and sometimes on specific versions. So um, it has to be fairly recent. You can't use it with old stuff because it's a new library. OK. Can you show the repository one more time? Which one? The repository packets can you show one more time? So you should have repositories for each entity. The repositories. So like this one? You, you define repositories for the aggregate roots. So in this example, which uh, you have a repository for bricks, you have a repository for Lego models, and if you implement the rest of the diagram, you would also have age groups, and I think there was something else. But not for every entity, Zona, but for every aggregate root, which is actually the same thing you should do for um, Spring Data JPA and all variants for Spring Data. Mm -hmm. Um, no, the Spring Data JDBC, also the question, if I got it right, is just like what is part of an aggregate, right? And what is a different aggregate? And the way Spring Data JDBC does that is really simple. It starts as, a, as an aggregate at the aggregate root and tries to navigate across references and everything it finds it considers part of that aggregate. If you want to navigate to a different aggregate root, you have to do that by an ID which then just gets handled as a normal ID by Spring Data JDBC, but you know it's a different aggregate. Um, time is pretty much up. If anybody else has uh, questions, I will be um, for some time in front of the door.
And um, if you come up with questions later, feel free to contact me on Jira, Stack Overflow, Twitter, or just write an email. Thank you. You're welcome.